It's very striking how from the time of the Eroica Symphony onwards, Beethoven is pairing his new works, he's pairing his symphonies, and they're often in direct opposition to one another. They seem to be in terms of mood and structure, in terms of key, of course. Nowhere is this more apparent than in the juxtaposition of Symphony No. 4 in B-flat, in Opus 60, as an answer to the E-flat symphony, the Eroica. I mean, whereas the Eroica is all to do with majesty and grandeur and, and ambition, this symphony is much more to do with uh, magic, to do with an eerie, oldest time feeling, primitive feeling. It starts off almost as an answer to Haydn's representation of chaos in, in the uh, oratorio of the creation. Something very, very murky and um, indistinct. I feel more than in any other symphony up to this point, Beethoven is saying to the listener, trust me, I'll take you by the hand, I'm going to lead you through this very, very, very murky area and we'll come to the light, but you have to be patient. And he does so in this slow introduction. But then at the end of, of, of 35, 36 bars, he says, I can see the daylight. Come with me into the daylight. And he goes, it's like a, a motorbike revving up. And we're suddenly into a, an ebullient Allegro Vivace. And then, to, oh, we, that's Beethoven. We know where we are. This is, without any question, my favorite of all the nine symphonies. I love the way that it's celebrating the symphony in its four movements as form. Berlioz absolutely adored this symphony, and adored all the Beethoven symphonies, and he, along with Richard Wagner, sat in the Salle du Conservatoire in Paris in 1828 when these symphonies were performed with a degree of care in the interpretation, in the degree of the preparation that hadn't uh, existed during Beethoven's own lifetime. And what Beethoven um, transmitted to Berlioz, to Hector Berlioz, was this idea, which is very much associated with Schiller and with William Tell, of a mountain stream, a colossal mountain cascade of, of, of a river coming out of, of, of the Alps, as it were, and then flowing, gushing down over, over waterfalls into a plain, a beautiful plain and actually going underground. And uh, so it becomes a subterranean murmur. And then up it comes again. It breaks the crust of the earth. And there's this colossal kind of effulgent um, explosion of musical joy.
I think it's with the Fourth Symphony that the poignancy of Beethoven's physical condition uh, becomes most apparent. Not that there's any lapses of um, accurate writing for instruments, on the contrary, that his memory, his musical memory of how orchestra sounded when he was growing up before his hearing went, you realize that he is, he's writing for an orchestra that was in a sense fictitious or at least um, uh, a kind of um, figment of his, of his own hearing and his own imagination that he couldn't validate by or prove that it was working because he couldn't hear it. And that is so touching and it shows such an amazing courage on his part to pursue and to persist in writing for an orchestra, knowing as he did that the players were not capable of grasping it or I suppose that was what was behind his remarks that he was not writing for now, he was writing for all eternity. And nowhere is this more clear than in the second movement, the Adagio, um, where it's based on a simple alternation of two notes. Yim, bom, 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 bom. That is the, the nugget of the accompaniment, which then becomes a theme that he develops. And he hands it from the second violins at the beginning to the entire orchestra in the ninth bar. And then in the coda section of this movement, he lets the timpani have it. I mean, that is such a, a master stroke that the timpani, which is of course associated with military bands and, 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 and with rhythm, is given this as a solo just before the penultimate bar. Yes, that's it. Good, very good. I love that movement and it's beautifully played. After the ineffable peace and tranquility of the slow movement, Beethoven's scherzo is right back in the groove and he is writing hemiola after hemiola. I mean, he's writing a, 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 um, a scherzo, allegro molto e vivace, which normally should be yep, and he goes He's writing it right across the beats. He's phrasing in 2-4 in a, basically a 3-4 movement with sforzandi, with syncopations. And he does it both in an aggressive way, in a, in a military way, and in an incredibly elegant way. Masterful.
one of the real kind of conundrums that faces any conductor um, is the question of metronome markings and Beethoven. How literally, how closely should one follow them? It can be done, but there are huge challenges. This last movement of the Fourth Symphony is marked Allegro ma non troppo, and then he writes as a metronome mark, minim equals 80. That's... That's... It's very quick, that. Pretty reasonable tempo. The, certainly the tempos that he heard when he was sitting in his chair looking at his score rather than standing in, in a concert hall in, in front of an orchestra whom he couldn't hear. So that was the real tempo that he heard in his inner ear. Two things happened. First of all, you put the bassoon, who has a famous solo in there, into a state of heart attack or an in, incipient in heart attack. And also you're in danger of losing the clarity and space. You've got to make decisions on a particular day in a particular hall. Uh, depending on the size of the hall and the acoustics and the number of players and the number of people sitting in the audience before you can come up with a, uh, with a solution. Please don't forget the, the dog and, the, and the, his dirty nose and trying to, you know, it comes up with a truffle. It comes up with a wonderful truffle. Oh, God, they're so delicious. You know, on, on fried eggs in the morning, just grated. Oh, my God. I had no idea that I had truffles on, on the farm. And I do. I'm not telling you where either. <laughs> If we believe, which so many of us do, that these symphonies are in fact evergreen pieces, that they are not just period pieces that reflect the fascinating times in which Beethoven grew, but, but have a message or have a content and have a, a, a substance that can enchant and, and inspire us, it puts that responsibility on us to, to find ways to reconstruct that imaginary orchestra that, that he was writing for.